Um, hello and welcome everybody um, to this 2022 journal and um, paper showcase event hosted by the Royal Meteorological Society's um, Insurance Special Interest Group. My name is Hannah Mallinson um, and I'm the Science Engagement Manager here at the Royal Meteorological Society and um, it's really lovely to have so many of you um, joining us today. So if I just advance my slides. Okay, so um, just need to start with a little bit of housekeeping um, before we um, get started. So, oh, sorry, my slides have gone forward. Um, okay, so there's a list of recommended browsers at the top here. Um, hopefully you're already aware of these if you're successfully in the meeting. Um, if you want to make your PowerPoint slides any bigger, then the best way to do that is to close the chat, um, which will enlarge the screen for you. And then throughout today's um, event, if you have questions for speakers, we ask that you please ask these um, using the Q&A section um, rather than the chat. This just helps us to, to keep those questions separate um, and allow for any discussion that you want to have within the chat. OK, so before we kick off, um, I wanted to just introduce um, the Royal Meteorological Society for to those basically who may not have come across us before um, and I also just want to touch on where this event has kind of come from. So we are the um, UK's professional and learner society for all things weather and climate and we work to strengthen the science um, and raise awareness of the importance of weather and climate, support meteorological professionals and inspire enthusiasts. Now, we are a membership organisation. We have roughly um, 3,000 members, but we do exist for the benefit of all. Um, we do a wide variety of work, which includes activities and events um, for members, for the general public, for policy and decision makers, and the wider meteorological and climate community. In the second half of 2022, last year, um, the society set up the Insurance Special Interest Group to basically help uh, the society's engagement with the insurance sector. And this group is formed of 14 academic and industry professionals who together will be supporting the um, creation of content and activities uh, that address the meteorological needs of those working in the insurance sector, facilitate discussion on potential future research and also highlight um, career opportunities. Now, the group is managed by a number of people, including myself, um, Hannah Bloomfield, who is um, an RMET Science Engagement Fellow, and also Katie Latham, who is the um, Insurance SIG Chair and who is also chairing the event today. Um, for more information on the Insurance Special Interest Group, you can visit the URL on the right hand side of this um, slide. Um, the Insurance SIG has now met twice um, and this event today is actually the first to be hosted by the group. For those of you who are unaware, um, the Society has a variety of content um, and opportunities to offer the insurance industry, and many of which are shown here. We have a number of relevant um, blog articles, podcasts, short briefing papers, um, masterclasses and academic research papers. And there are some examples listed on that right hand side um, image and more information on these and actually links through to all of these resources are available at that um, URL at the bottom, armets.org forward slash insurance. Uh, talking about publications, so the Society has eight peer reviewed journals. Uh, you can see them all along the top Geoscience Data Journal, Atmospheric Science Letters, Quarterly Journal, Meteorological Applications, Weather, International Journal of Climatology, Climate Resilience and Sustainability, and Wise Climate Change. These cover um, atmospheric science, meteorology, and climatology. And we publish a variety of different articles um, across all of these journals for different audience types. Um, and again, you can find more information on these at that URL at the bottom. As shown by the red arrows, today's event will be showcasing research from meteorolog meteorological applications, climate resilience, sustainability, and wires climate change. Last slide from me here. So I just wanted to mention um, that, oh, sorry, it keeps um, skipping along. Um, the society membership, I wanted to mention uh, the, some of the benefits of potentially joining us. So these include exclusive access to professional masterclass recordings, um, discounts at chargeable events, uh, opportunity to gain professional accreditation and also access to eight peer-reviewed um, journals. So if you are interested in becoming a member, then please do head to our membership pages on our website. 
Uh, now that's my introduction over, so I'm going to hand over to Katie Latham now, um, who, as I said, is the chair of the Armets Insurance SIG. She's a registered meteorologist with us, um, and she works as a senior catastrophe risk analyst at Willis Towers Watson. So over to you, Katie. And I'll stop sharing now. Perfect. Thank you very much, Hannah. And um, yeah, thank you for the introductions as well. So um, to kick off the um, first of our talks, I will um, hand over to uh, Kelly um, Dorkano from uh, Lund University um, in Sweden, who will be talking um, about her paper titled A Critical Review of the, Dis the, the Disproportionality um, of Loss and Damage from Climate Change. Over to you, Kelly. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Hannah. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank the Armed Society for the invitation to speak today and all of you for attending this presentation. My name is Kelly Dorkeno. I'm a PhD candidate at Lund University Center for Sustainability Studies. And today I'll be presenting a paper that was published in Wires Climate Change titled A Critical Review of Disproportionality in Loss and Damage from Climate Change and which was co-authored with Dr. Emily Boyd and Dr. Murray Scound. Okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to get to... There, okay. So a bit of background for this work. Um, well, today we're seeing a, a rise in the number of extreme weather events and intertwined social and ecological consequences of climate change are increasingly interacting with socioeconomic inequalities, exacerbating them as well. So in parallel of this, um, there has been a rise in discussions surrounding loss and damage in the context of international negotiations um, in, under the UNFCCC. So loss and damage is considered as the third pillar behind mitigation and adaptation to climate change. And it's very much linked to these growing calls for climate justice um, from activists, um, negotiators, and scholars as well. And questions of responsibility surrounding climate change have come, in, have come to the forefront of this discussion. So why focus on disproportionality? Why this paper, essentially? So disproportionality as a concept is not new. It's something that emerged back in the 1980s um, in scholarship and movements around environmental justice, uh, specifically in the US and communities of color in relation to toxic waste. But today we've seen a rise in the use of the term in the context of climate change. So for instance, you see this quote on the right hand side from Dr. Bullard, which is a scholar in environmental justice, where he speaks of the responsibility for climate change and the brunt of the burden, saying that this proportionality makes it a serious social justice issue. So essentially the aim with this paper was to kind of understand and explore and understand how scholars engage with, uh, with this um, concept and term conceptually, methodologically and empirically, because it's been quite implicit so far. Um, and we chose the format of a critical review to identify gaps and assess the relevance of the concept. So to do that, we began by um, identifying different uh, themes and concepts that are used in other fields uh, that use disproportionality to build an analytical framework. So here you can see three main themes, the risk, impacts, and burdens and responsibility within each the different dimensions that we looked at. So for risk, we have hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. Impacts, uh, we have resource access, differences in resource access, culture, and knowledge. For burdens and responsibility, uh, it revolves around power and power asymmetries, normativity and causality. So these uh, themes are divided, but in a sense, they have interconnections. So the divisions are mostly instrumental to guide or review. Um, in terms of methods, um, it's a systematized literature review. And we started off with about 1,500 articles and then focused on loss and damage article specifically, because the concept is quite core and it's very present in the discourse around loss and damage. On the left-hand side, you can see the different strands of research that are including, included within loss and damage. We use that as a way to 
give more nuance to our results because there are different um, disciplines that come in to this space of loss and damage research, so to speak. So as part of these 205 articles, we found 99 that actually engage with the, the concept of disproportionality, but only 63 they do, they do it through a conceptualization or operationalize it um, in their methodology. And NVivo was used to do text searches and manual coding of the articles. So in terms of results, as I mentioned earlier, about 50% of these articles engage with this proportionality, 67% conceptualize and operationalize the concept. But what we find is that mostly um, the ones that actually um, engage with the concept are found in the justice, ethics, and law literature. It's not such a big surprise because the concept, as I mentioned, is very much linked to questions of justice. And I guess in terms of the law, um, uh, questions of proportionality and so on. But in terms of operationalized in, in um, the methodology and so on, it's in the risk and vulnerability and development um, strands of literature that it is most um, present. So in terms of disproportionality in risk, some key aspects that came up are the magnitude, frequency, and combination of hazards. So people will talk of disproportionality in this context, and especially in the context of compound events. So um, cyclical dynamics over time and spatial concentration of hazards that can lead to an existential threat for some um, places, regions, or groups. Uh, some hotspots were also identified, for instance, small islands because of their low elevation and small land mass, but also mountainous areas because of fragile ecosystems and communities that depend upon them. And then there were discussions also disproportionate in the context of this outsized or big ticket impact, um, which talk about, for instance, a relatively small change in temperature at nighttime during the growing season in one location, leading to as much as 10% loss yields. So these were talked about as big ticket impact. Um, okay, now if we go to the impacts, themselves, some of the characteristics for groups uh, that are sub subject to or expected to be subject to this disproportionate impacts so or disproportionate loss and damage, uh, we find poverty, gender, age, and indigeneity. Also, land-based livelihoods in agrarian context are quite prominent, uh, often due to um, conditions of subsistence. So a lot of um, um, people that live in land-based uh, in agrarian context, sorry, and have land-based livelihoods uh, tend to meet a big portion of their needs non-economically. So then when we talk about impacts, some, um, some aspects can go unnoticed um, because of that, because of difficulty in measuring. And then to take it a bit further, there are discussions about um, questions of violation of rights to culture and self-determination specifically for groups that are more dependent on natural resources as part of their social, physical, and cultural well-being. Then when we look at disproportionality in burdens and responsibility, what came up most often is responsibility for the problem, um, with those being the least responsible, bearing the, bearing the brunt of it. So there is this notion of historical injustice and climate debt, for instance, between countries with some nations having to reallocate their resources to face the consequences of climate change, resources which are quite scarce um, already. Then there were discussions in terms of marginalization in representation and procedures, for instance, in the context of international negotiations uh, in climate change, but also in science, especially for indigenous people. Finally, in terms of normative frames, we find that justice um, or theories of justice were quite strong, but also human rights um, as a basis for addressing disproportionality. We also looked at the methods and the scale at which uh, um, scholars were talking about disproportionality. And we find that there was most of the evidence was remained focused on the national scale and with categories coming from policy. So developed versus developing countries. But these broad categories also can make some groups invisible within um, certain locations, for instance, within industrialized countries, developed countries, um, marginalized groups would appear as not disproportionately impacted, whereas there are more nuanced approaches to, to capture these differences. 
So overall, um, the method methodology um, methods and the choice of um, approach to capture this proportionality were not very attuned um, to this particular uh, situation. Um, and then when it comes to the type of, um, of studies, we found that there are very few longitudinal and cross-case studies or intersectional analysis, which is a critical gap. So to conclude, um, this proportionality more broadly is kind of a multidimensional concept. It can span the dimensions of risk, impacts, burdens, and responsibility. And in doing so, it kind of bridges this social environmental um, and past future interface. It is strongly rooted in questions of justice and hence it kind of calls for this examination of deeply rooted structural inequalities, um, which we uh, which I discussed earlier in relation to historical um, climate depth and so on. Um, in terms of its relevance, it put potential use, it's quite um, linked to questions of climate risk, for instance, from compound events, so identifying locations that are particularly at risk from these, but also questions of responsibility and compensation, especially in the context of the newly established fund under the uh, COP27 in relation to loss and damage. Um, and looking forward, uh, one big, uh, one uh, important aspect is to think about this concept more meaningfully, both in research and policy, because it's really there is really a strong uptake of the term in advocacy and in science and so on. But uh, so far, uh, based on this review, we can say that um, the methodological aspect and the um, engagement with it is not as strong as it could be. There could be learnings to take from earlier work in other fields, such as disaster studies and environmental justice uh, scholarship. That's it for me. Um, thank you for your attention. These are my references. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I do just have one question um, from the chat and um, just a quick reminder um, to all the participants that you can send a, a question for any of our um, um, like speakers at, at any time. Um, just please like, pop, pop it in the Q&A box um, on your screen. Uh, but yes, Kelly, the one question I have for you, um, uh, the compounds event uh, the compound events comment is very interesting. Are there particular types of compound events or regions that are more studied in the literature? Mm. Okay. Trying to remember, I think small islands came up um, quite strongly because of the coastal areas. So essentially, um, tide surges, as well as cyclones, um, and risk of um, rising seas, were talked about as one of these compound events. But apart from this, I'm afraid I can't recall more than that. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, there's no other questions yet. Um, but yeah, as I say, if we'll, we'll come back to Kelly if um, any other questions do come up any point throughout um, today's call. Um, so with that then, thank you very much, Kelly, and we'll move on to the next speaker of the day, um, who will be Chris White. Um, oh, bear with me, trying to say Strathclyde University. <laughs> um, and uh, he'll be talking about his paper titled, A Review of Early Severe Weather Applications of High Resolution Regional Reanalysis in Australia. Um, over to you, Chris. Um, thank you very much. Um, thanks for the, the introduction. Yes, Strathclyde, it's um, um, we're a couple of universities here in Glasgow, and this is the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, as opposed to the University of Glasgow. So just, just to really kind of confuse everyone. Um, thanks very much for this. I'll just put my thing over to one side. I hope you can see my slides all okay there. Um, the first thing I'll just uh, head off right at, at the outset is that why is this someone, me, in Glasgow, uh, in Scotland talking about a reanalysis that was done in Australia, which would be a very good question probably to, to ask. So I'm going to head that question off right at the outset that I was in Australia for a number of years. I was there for eight and a half years or so, um, both at the 
Bureau of Meteorology for a period of time, um, and then before and after that at the University of Tasmania in Hobart. So this is a project that I was involved in when I was there, and it continued um, after I left Australia and came to Scotland um, a few years back, and so I sort of partially took this project with me. After that then became this paper that I'm here to talk a little bit about today, uh, which was some of the early applications of the project, which was to produce a higher resolution reanalysis data set for Australia. So um, I have therefore very quickly at the beginning here, just to sort of obviously very much acknowledge the lead in this piece of work, which is Paul Fox Hughes, who's at the Bureau of Meteorology in Hobart, who's a, who's a first colleague of mine, we worked together on this. And of course, everyone else that is on here, all of which are Australian based. So I'm sure they're probably all in bed and hopefully none of them have, have bothered to dial in for this, um, given it's some uh, godly hour of the morning. So I'm here uh, um, as the sole representative um, uh, for this. This is the paper that I'm here to talk about. Um, it was published in Meteorological Applications. Uh, it was published midway through last year. Um, and uh, was a sort of was just saying there in, in the outset, this was one of the sort of, I suppose, finale pieces that we did uh, on the back of what was a three, three and a half year modeling project uh, run by the Bureau of Metrology in Australia, uh, of which I had um, sort of a, a key role from, from one perspective uh, within. And what we wanted to do in this piece of work is to demonstrate I suppose the usability of the reanalysis product that we had created over that period of time. Now anyone that's done modeling projects, and I will get onto the applications primarily, but anyone that's done um, any kind of modeling projects where you're producing something new for the first time, it involves an awful lot of people and there are much, there's a much broader range of people that sit behind it than just are on this paper here. Um, but one thing we were very keen on uh, as we were doing this project is to demonstrate its usability uh, because it was a new product that hadn't been produced um, uh, um, up, up to that point, there hadn't been an attempt to do this within the Australian region. The focus then of, of this paper, and indeed my, my talk, is severe weather applications, and I'll try and touch on some of the potential applications and some of the demonstrations that we did within this paper that pulled uh, or you know, that utilised the data um, that, that we, or the data set that we produced as part of the uh, the broader uh, reanalysis um, project as we go through. So just for everyone's benefit, for, I'll, I'll just start with, um, I guess, getting everyone making sure we're on the same page here with well, what is a reanalysis? Uh, pr probably a lot of us, if not all of us, have either had an awareness or indeed have used reanalysis data sets, uh, often when we perhaps don't have the full uh, range of observations, uh, certainly perhaps um, atmospheric uh, levels, uh, or indeed uh, soil levels that we might not have in, in observations. Reanalysis data sets, large scale climate um, um, that we perhaps don't have, will often get um, uh, filled in using reanalysis data sets. Now, reanalysis is, I suppose, our best historical analysis of what has happened in the past. So it's a backward looking sort of data set. It's not observations, but it's based on observations and many other things that feed into a data set is then analyzed. So it's remodeled using a standardized process um, that then produces in effect what would have been observed in that period of time on the basis of the chemistry, the physics that, that are in there and the observations that, that, are, that are, are forcing it. It therefore provides, a reanalysis data in general therefore provides a consistent data set that you can use for climatological um, studies to look at trends, to look at impacts of different um, processes, and indeed then start to look at different applications of how you'd use this information. Now, there are, there are a number of data sets out there, global reanalysis data sets, ERA, uh, ERA Interim, for example, NSEP, again, many of us are probably familiar with those products, but they're relatively coarse solution, um, uh, resolution, which means they can resolve some processes, but of course some they can't. So for the Australian region, it was identified that there would be a significant benefit both from a meteorological forecasting perspective, but also from the application perspective of producing a much higher resolution reanalysis data set to fill in quite simply many of the gaps in knowledge and processes that uh, were known to exist in Australia. And anyone that knows uh, Australia and the Australian topography and region, um, yes, it's a, a hot place, 
uh, by and large, but there's an awful lot of variation within there as well. And there's an awful lot of topography. There's also, of course, an extensive coastline around Australia and indeed more broadly across the Australasian region. Most of that, or a lot of that, isn't captured within the coarse resolution um, reanalysis uh, data sets. The figure you've got here is era interim. So this is one of the global reanalysis data sets. That's 80 kilometers. This is just showing uh, 10 meter zonal wind. Um, and you can see, you know, this is one part. This is the sort of southeast corner, and uh, I think uh, down in, in, uh, into New South Wales, um, shows a reasonable resolution. But at 80 kilometers, you're only going to pick up some um, uh, some of the uh, the artifacts, as well as some of the processes and some of the, some of the the information that you would need from a reanalysis data. At a higher resolution, and I'll explain a little bit of what these two are in a second before I get into the application, but at 12 kilometer resolution, you're starting to pick up, of course, a lot more detail in here that starts to pick up the topography and a bit more realistic. And then again, if you then go to an even higher resolution, at this point here, we're starting to see something that uh, is far more usable and let's say um, uh, uh, demonstrating what we would think of as reality. Even at one and a half kilometers, that's still relatively coarse compared to reality. We know that wind in this case, of course, vary very much at, at more local scales than that. But this sort of data set will give us a whole range of information that we just didn't have available to us before. For this, pro this project, it was a three, three and a half year project called uh, Barra. I, Hard off the top of the head, remember exactly what the word, what the letters Barra stand for. But basically, it's the Bureau of Meteorology's Regional Reanalysis, something in there that that says Barra. Um, uh, it had two domains the, in those figures I, I was just showing there. The first domain is twelve kilometers. That covers actually a much larger region than just Australia. It is very much Australasia, includes the southern half of India, includes New Zealand, Indonesia, and several other countries and islands within there as well. And then within those are, were also then produced um, uh, four sub-regions or four different uh, four, uh, higher resolution areas at the one and a half or pro approximately one and a half kilometer scale as well, including Tasmania. And that's the reason that I was involved in the project because uh, we were, it was a very much a collaborative project and we got the, the support and the funding from the Tasmanian government side to help support the national, indeed international process that, that produced the reanalysis data set. Just a side note before I get on to, to, to the, the final bit, Barra is a data set, is, is, is available, you can access it already, it's been out for a couple of years. That's called, or largely been called Barra One, or it, it's, it's referred to. There is a new data set which is currently in production at the moment, which adds additional information to what we what wasn't done before. So nothing stands still. There's always um, a, a newer and better version. But just uh, I'll I'll mention Barra Two again in just a second. But for the purposes of this paper that I'm here to talk about today. Um, we used Barra 1, this was the data set that was available, but I will have a nod towards where Barra 2 is going at the moment. It doesn't involve me, but, uh, but uh, I'll just kind of put the, put the shout out there for the Bureau of Meteorology and what they're up to at the moment. Um, in terms of applications then, which really of course is the focus, well, is one of the main reasons we did the, the, the uh, produce the data set in the first place and why the Bureau of Meteorology wanted it, um, but also from the, the perspective, of course, of today's talk is the applications, is how can we use, how can this information, this additional higher resolution information be useful? Now, again, this paper that we produced and we put out in uh, uh, meteorological applications was, uh, is severe weather focused. So I've got three examples here that were pulled from the paper. There are a few more in here, and I've noted the figure number as the, these figure numbers relate to the figure numbers that are actually in the paper itself. The first one is to do with the sighting of portable uh, automatic weather stations during periods of elevated fire danger. The Bureau of Meteorology and the fire services have weather stations at particular locations. Again, we're looking at New South Wales here at the moment in the southeast of, um, of Australia, down into Victoria, just at the bottom there, just peeking in. Um, the sighting of those weather stations, the static weather stations, of course, is done. But within there, of course, is a significant, there are significant gaps. So what this data set was enabled to do was then to correlate known forest or FFDI, so forest fire danger index data, with the topography that comes from the models and the information that came out of the reanalysis to say, where are the gaps? Where should, in, during times of when the FFDI reaches a particular level, where should these portable stations um, be cited to help the monitoring, the modeling, 
uh, the response, I guess, most importantly, during uh, forest fire um, events. They weren't able to do this before. This was a key, an absolutely key ask from the fire services that were also involved in this project as to what they wanted from the reanalysis data set. Thinking a bit more towards perhaps the insurance sector as well as others, but perhaps building codes, planning um, as well more broadly is wind. So wind shear, storms of, of course, so severe or very gusty winds and, uh, and everything from there through to the siting of where you would place wind farms. Um, this is, a, again, was a, a key ask from the reanalysis data set is can we produce or can we put together a better data set that would give us a much greater uh, resolution on wind. Here we've got um, the top row is Barra R, so Barra R is the 12 kilometer large scale domain and the pH, this is the, the southwest or Western Australia basically, the southwest Western Australia, which is kind of one of those highlighted areas, it includes Perth in here um, at the one and a half kilometer scale. And you can see within the months, just that increased resolution of the potential applications that can come from that. And again, I think perhaps insurance is a key one in terms of the usability or, or the, the use of, of this information. And the final one, which I'll end on, um, otherwise I'll just keep talking, is um, to do with design uh, rainfall. As a hydrologist by background that occasionally masquerades as a meteorologist, um, uh, uh, of course, rainfall is a always something that you want to get better data on. Reanalysis data sets probably have a bit of a, 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 um, a reputation of not being particularly good in, in some of those. So what we really wanted to do in Barra in this project and therefore in this paper was demonstrate actually we can get a much better, um, some much better, much higher resolution information out of a reanalysis data set with regards to rainfall, thinking therefore to flood risk studies, um, uh, both either from a a study of a pre-event, but also perhaps from a response pers uh, perspective. It's not perfect. On that far, bottom right hand side there, you can see that uh, observed relative to the models, we're quite a bit out past the one sort of sub daily time scales. But definitely by the time you get to the daily total, the 24 hour rainfall totals, we're pretty much matching up with observations um, for this particular occasion here that we're on the Gold Coast up in, in Queensland as an example. Again, these are all details. So what we did in this paper is have a series of case studies. And so I've just picked, uh, picked three of them here. And I mentioned that um, about Barra 2 just a moment ago. This is a, a bit of a, a look forward to what is currently being done with Barra 2. The reason I'm showing this is because I didn't have the same for Barra 1. So I'm showing Barra 2 here um, as a nice animation to, to end on. Here, this is the East Australian floods that happened uh, last year in uh, 2022. Um, so, of course, the, the reanalysis data will be extended to include this period. But here you can see a, a, a really neat um, uh, comparison, a visual comparison, where you've got ERA uh, on the left hand side, ERA, the global sort of reanalysis data set, and then what will come out of Barra 2 on the right hand side from the events and the flooding that, that occurred um, on here. So, again, the potential use and application of this, I think, is really quite apparent where you can start to see the resolution that comes, uh, comes from something like this. Um, I'll say, and there, uh, thank you. I'm probably a little bit over my 10 minutes, I'm very sorry. Um, but I'll stop and ask if anyone has any questions. Thanks very much. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, now you're, you're okay time-wise. Um, so um, yeah, thank you for your um, like interesting talk there. I do have one question in from um, our participants. Um, so I'll read that now. Uh, the figure of wind speed for Barra SY seems to show strong boundary effects. How do we know that those are not affecting the results inside the model domain? Yeah, um, uh, good, good question. I think we um, we spent quite a bit of time looking at the observations that we had uh, from wind. Um, I think, like any data set, though, there are going to be artifacts like this, and I think a lot of the learnings that we did with Barra One, they are. It's not, I say I'm not involved in Barra 2, but they're very much looking at um, um, how to feed that into, into Barra 2. So specifically to do with the, the, the boundary effects, yes, I'd agree. I think there are some of those within there. Are they model? Are they other? Um, I think that's probably work in, in progress. Um, but I think generally what I'm, I think with this paper in particular, we're trying to show is sort of the broader sort of, um, usability. The questions like this, um, 
there are other papers which where we cover some of the, the processes in more detail about how the data set was produced um, and um, I suppose the skill of that data set um, afterwards I can point people to, to those papers um, as well. They're not on this paper, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay, that's great. Thanks so much. Um, we do have uh, one more question I think we have time for, so um, I'll read that out now. Um, how, how does Barra do with capturing extreme events like cyclones? Um, uh, so the two, I suppose, two two ways to answer that question. So uh, I, I'm unaware of any dedicated studies yet that have looked specifically at cyclones within uh, the that um, are being captured by uh, the Barra dataset. Um, but given what we were showing there, say with the extreme rainfall and the and winds, um, we're pretty confident that cyclones are captured particularly well because things like sea level pressure is pretty robust within the reanalysis data set. And of course, the, the pressure is going to very much dem be demonstrated in, in the cyclones. Um, again, I'm not too sure what the chats at um, the Bureau of Meteorology are doing with Barra 2, um, but I would imagine cyclones, of course, are going to be a key component of that because the Australian region, of course, is very much affected with cyclones. So I can't really answer your question um, uh, directly. Um, but um, I, I think with the resolution that, that we've got in, in the model, I think that there are there's some good skill that will come out of it. Perfect, thank you. And uh, there, is, there is another one. Um, do these regional reanalyses exist in any um, exist in many other parts of the world? Yes, they do. Um, I don't have the slide in this this set. Actually, there are uh, three or four um, of those. Um, are these slides going to get shared after the, the event? I'm happy to sort of dig out that slide and add them to these slides, if not. Um, I believe so. Um, one of the handers can correct me if I'm wrong. I think okay. it will be. Uh, if, if not, um, yes. So the answer is yes. Um, I don't have the information to hand, but yes, there are. Um, there's one for the one for the US. There's another sort of that covers the, the European region. I believe there might be one that covers um, the Indian region as well. But um, it's a little while since I, I last looked at that information, so I can't say off the top of my head. Okay, that's perfect. Thanks very much. And um, uh, yeah, I'll uh, leave it there for questions. But obviously, please do continue to drop your questions into the chat. Um, if, if if anybody does have some, but thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Right, and with that, then I'll move on to our third speaker, um, who is Thurston um, Wagner from the University of Potsdam. Um, we'll be talking about their paper titled "On the Evaluation of Climate Change Impact Models." Um, over to you, Thurston. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, I hope you can see my slides now. Um, so I'd like to take 10 minutes to talk a little bit about um, a perspective paper that we wrote for uh, Why is Climate Change? So it's a perspective paper, not a review, so it's short. So you've been pleased to hear. Um, the topic that interested us and caused us to, to write this piece is the question of how do we evaluate climate change impact models. We wrote this um, based on longer term discussion I had with my colleague here in Potsdam, Robert Reinecke, and with a former colleague from the University of Bristol, where I was previously Francesca Pianosi. Um, the reason why we think this is a relevant question is because the question of how will human induced climate change, land cover change, and other alterations impact water, energy, and biogeochemical cycles is a key question for our society today, in particular with respect to when vulnerability thresholds critical to us will be reached. Um, we need simulation models to address these questions, and the, the typical chain of such a model would look like this, we have global climate model to um, look at scenario projections. These are downscaled dynamically or statistically, and we have a, use it to run an impact model to look at things like flood risk or drought frequency, water supply reliability, or groundwater recharge. 
The point is that all of these models that we use um, are imperfect representations of reality. And it's a key to understand their, the value these models have and their projections have um, is to understand how imperfect they actually are and what implications that has. Um, traditionally, if we look at, at modeling, what we might look at is how accurate the model, accurate the model is. So we try to look at the distance of our model predictions from historical observations. And we might look at the position. So if we have uncertain model projections, we might look at how close together or far apart they are to see whether the model or models has, has more or less confidence into uh, being able to predict what we are looking at. Now, the, the problem is that um, this is not quite feasible if we if we look forward, um, and we need a slightly different framework. Now, in a recent study by Ecker et al., they surveyed over 160 water resources modelers to see how do they actually assess their their model and the quality of their model, but including when it comes to looking at climate change impact assessments of a scenario model. And what they found is that the predominant way to do this is by showing that the models can match historical observations. Now, the problem is that if we go forward in time, the real value of our model comes from looking at periods that are considerably different from the past and therefore being able to match the past is only an, an, um, a necessary maybe um, strategy to show that our model works, but it's it's not sufficient. Um, however, we can still look at other aspects than the aspect of precision, for example, for our future projections is something um, that doesn't that doesn't go away. So how do we use this? So in the discussion, we first of all discuss why the observation-based evaluation approach, so where we look at how accurate our models are, to matching historical observation is insufficient. Now, it's a, it's a sensible thing, and there's some very smart strategies so to look at particular wet periods or particular dry periods or other periods that somehow simulate, if you like, what the future might look like. But nonetheless, it doesn't give us, um, we feel, enough confidence into our models for looking at climate change impacts. The additional aspect that we put forward is to look at what we call response-based evaluation. So where we use um, modeling scenarios where we um, vary the inputs into the impact model, and that can be variability from historical variability or maybe by assessing plausible ranges or scenario-based input variations. And we look at how this variability of the input influences the variability of the model output. And from that, we can derive um, different types of information. Uh, particular advantages that we can do this regardless of whether we have observations of the target variable or not. The mathematical tools we use to do so are called global sensitivity analysis and the aspect of global is that we vary all the drivers inputs into the model simultaneously so that we can look at their interactions as well. So what can we what can we do with this? Um, well, we can derive different types of information that we can use for model evaluation under change. So if we vary our model inputs appropriately, and if we look at different aspects of the variability of the input and how it maps on the variability of our model output, then we can at least look at four things. We can look at consistency. So we can try to understand whether the behavior of the model is matching our system perception. So that's if we vary the parameters that represent the system. So soil types, soil characteristics, or land surface characteristics. We can look at elasticity. So there the focus is particular on how do the, does the uncertainty in the forcing precipitation or future temperature change the response of the model output? And is that elasticity of the model what we expect? We can look at leverage. 
So uh, do model decision levers show adequate influence? So here the idea is we put a particular focus on the parameters of the model that relate to decision relevant um, aspects. So for example, we might be able to control land use change. So we might want to evaluate whether land use change has an adequate influence given other uncertainties in the future. And attribution, can we attribute uncertainty sources throughout the projection horizon? Can we understand what uncertainties dominate over different time horizons? And I'll give you a couple of examples of this um, very briefly. So an example of elasticity is um, this study, which looked at how does the model system respond to plausible climate change in the context of uh, water resources systems models. And here, an input variability was created by using um, stochastic climate models, so weather simulators that were creating a plausible variability of the feasible input space here mapped on temperature and uh, precipitation, which was run through the impact model and the authors looked at um, um, a reservoir reliability index to understand under what combinations um, a future reservoir behavior was vulnerable or, or robust. So that's looking at whether the model would reproduce um, the adequate response of the forcing. And another example is an attribution example. So here the authors looked at temporal sensitivity of projected coastal defense vulnerability to input uncertainties. So their model of, um, in this case, uh, that was producing annual probability of exceedings of the coastal defenses has multiple inputs, uncertain inputs, wave setup, which is a parameter, offshore extreme values, and then sea level variability, climate change scenarios, and so forth. And what the authors showed very nicely is that in this graph, you see the red line is highest in the beginning. So the uncertainty coming from a parameter called wave setup, so a parameter that describes the smaller scale processes at the coast, that uncertainty is dominating for several decades before about mid of the 21st century, uncertainty in global sea level rise will then dominate the uncertainty in their estimate. So if you, depending on what time period, what time horizon you're interested in understanding, you will have to be confident that you can um, define different uncertainties or different input variabilities to understand what controls your model results. Um, so as a, as a final slide, um, we have other examples. We interacted with um, AXA Excel, for example, on looking at CAT models. This um, report here, you can, you can Google it has a mock-up example study with a, with a CAT model. Didn't put the link in there because it was covering like half of my slide. It's a very long link. Um, and if you're interested in these kind of um, methods, our um, own methods are available in uh, Python, R, and MATLAB. It's a toolbox that covers our methods and the key methods that are widely used for download from GitHub. And um, the paper has more details um, if you're interested. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks very much. Um, so we've got a couple of questions coming in. Um, so I'll just start with the ones I can see first. Um, so um, how can we evaluate a model in cases when we have a black box model or a model whose computational demand does not allow GSA to be applied? Yeah, in terms of um, the first one, so black box model. So um, several of the methods or the, and the methods we're, we're also using um, can be used on mapping the input and the output of your model. So you don't need to understand exactly what goes in, inside the model, if you like. Um, so you can still understand how and how strongly the inputs into your model control the outputs. Um, so um, several of the methods um, work perfectly with, without being able to look inside the model. Uh, in terms of computational demand, 
So there are, there are different types of methods that you can use. Um, screening methods like method of Morris would be GSA methods that are quite frugal in terms of computational demand. And there are even simpler ones you can use to approximate uh, GSA. So um, of course, the, the smaller the sample you run, the more um, uncertain your result, but there are also ways to account for that uncertainty so you at least see exactly what you can um, learn from your approximation. So there are some references in the, the paper which will point you to, to reviews which guide you through the methods. That's perfect, thank you. Um, on to the next question um, is from Alex Doyle. Um, do you have some examples for what kind of things we should base our system perception and or expectation on when looking for consistency or elasticity? Thank you. Yeah, so this depends very much on, on the system you're looking at and your understanding of the system. So what we very often do is we, we look at different systems, for example, how different catchment might respond to changing precipitation or precipitation extremes. And we look at the relative response, maybe more than the absolute response. So we might look at whether um, the kind of systems that we expend, expect to respond much, much faster because they're similar to, to other systems where we have observations um, respond in the same way. So is the model uh, behaving in a way to similar in a similar way to systems that we think are similar to the one we're looking at. So it's a it's a relative comparison most of the time. But we'll try to give some examples also in the in the paper because that particular this idea of can we look at consistency with our underlying system um, is something that I think is a very on much an ongoing discussion. Um, and there's a lot of other work going on in that area. Because I think it's it has a lot of potential to to help us learn more about our models. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And um, the last question, uh, I think, um, can you say more about how this global sensitivity analysis framework has been applied to any insurers' catastrophe models? And if so, do you know what the biggest input uncertainties were? Um, it, Yes and no. So there are example studies. We, we have some and, and there's some other applications to CAT models. The, the main point is that the, the input uncertainty is not the same depending on the case study you're looking at. So it depends on the situation, depends on the peril you look at, depends on the framework. So there isn't the, the, the whole um, important point of doing this sensitivity analysis is that there isn't one answer that will be the same everywhere or for every situation. So that makes it um, rather relevant to understand how this uncertainty changes. Um, and with these kind of methods that we discuss and uh, in the paper and that are part of our toolbox, um, you can start looking at that so that you get a feel for um, what uncertainties matter under what circumstances. So that that's the important part. It's it's not going to be one answer that that works everywhere. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. I think that's um, all the questions we have. Um, yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, um, Thorsten. Um, with that, we'll move on to our final of um, the uh, paper review talks before we go on to the panel discussion. Um, so uh, we have Dan Mitchell from the University of Bristol, who will be talking about um, the paper titled Increased Population Exposure to Amphan Cycle Cyclones Under Future Climates. Over to you, Dan. Oh, we can't hear you. Yeah, there we go. Thanks very much. Uh, hopefully you can see the slides. So I'm Dan Mitchell. I'm from the University of Bristol. Uh, this was a paper that we wrote a couple of years ago. Um, it was for it was for the journal uh, Climate Resilience and S Sustainability, which is uh, was very new at that point. I think we were sort of one of the first papers in there. Um, 
Uh, always risky going for a new journal, by the way, but it was Royal Met Sox, so we didn't we didn't mind going for it. So our paper is looking at um, a, a new way of coupling up uh, models, so climate models to impact models and and population exposure. Um, one of the things that, that this results in is a, a lot of authors, because you have to have a lot of experts along the way. And I'm not going to go into who all these authors are, um, just to say we've got uh, population exposure people, so, so Lawrence, we've got uh, flood inundation modelers, um, so James, and there's many there from the Fathom um, uh, company, which I suspect some of you will, will know of, they're a flood in, inundation company, um, storm surge modelers. Uh, then, because we're looking at um, this tropical cyclone called Amphan, which um, hit Bangladesh and India, we've also got some local climate scientists and hydrologists. So, um, uh, so um, Salim, for instance, is, uh, is is works on loss and damage. So, I suspect Kelly knows his work very well. Um, but a lot of the the work we're doing here is talking about uh, how. Uh, losses may not have occurred um, if we hadn't had human-induced climate change. So um, a lot of our stuff here speaks very nicely to the lo loss and damage agenda, although we didn't explicitly address that here in, in this, this proposal. So there's a lot of people involved here, and um, uh, I, I guess that that's reflected in this figure here. I mean, so, I, to be honest, Thorsten's explanation of uh, coupling models was much better than this, and neater graphics, but... But essentially, we've gone from a climate model. Um, there are various different resolutions of climate models. So I'm not talking about the, the regional climate level data that Chris talked about in, in his talk. I'm talking about global climate models, which can predict sea level rise. So these typical models are, are of the order of 100 kilometers. Um, a storm surge model, so that's a separate thing a flood inundation model, which is again a separate thing, and then a population model. And so the problem here, and Solston mentioned this, was that at each, at each stage here, you've got uncertainty in your model. And so you're combining an uncertain model with a, a, another uncertain model. And you sort of get away with it when you do it two times, but, but here we're doing it four times. Um, and so that was a real problem. And I'll talk a little bit about how we, um, how we dealt with uncertainty in that, in that case. So going back to the exact question we're asking, we're doing something called an extreme extreme event attribution study. That'll mean something to some of you and, and to others it, it won't. Essentially it is when we have an extreme event, and that could be a heat wave or, or in this case a tropical cyclone, um, many people asked the question how would that event changed if we'd never had uh, a greenhouse gases pumped into the atmosphere? And um, strictly speaking, it's an, it's an impossible question to answer because uh, you could never take an event and have the exact same event in, say, uh, a world with different greenhouse gases. So strictly speaking, it, it, it's not a, a well-posed question. But in reality, it does provide a nice context for, for many things we want to answer, especially in the insurance sector. And so we can say, for instance, if an Anth Anthan like tropical cyclone hit uh, Bangladesh, but under different levels of global warming, how, how would that extreme event change in terms of the risk? So that's what, what we're looking at. Um, how do I get rid of this, this thing? Hide video panel. Um, so this is the, this is this track of, uh, of Amthan. Um, India is in white here and Bangladesh is in grey, so it sort of hit the border of India, Bangladesh. Um, this, what we've done here is we plotted the storm, uh, storm surge height along the coast. So you can see here that really the values are around two to four metres, depending on where you are on the coast. So that's, that's really high if you really just visualise that in your, in your office or at your desk at the moment. Two to four meters is extremely high. Um, if that occurs at the wrong time within a tide, uh, that can be particularly uh, devastating. But what we're looking at is if you have uh, sea level rise caused by human-induced climate change, 
uh, you've got this sort of storm surge sitting on top of that sea level rise. So, so essentially, you can get the uh, storm surge pushed much further inland. So that was what the paper was about. So actually, my colleague um, from Fathom um, uh, wrote this this talk initially, and he wrote it for the insurance sector, as as they are a sort of insurancey type firm. Um, and so he has included sort of very relevant things that perhaps I wouldn't have here. But this was the Cyclone Anfan um, inundation forecast. Uh, so 20th of May 2020. And it essentially the UK uh, government, the UK aid asked Bristol, my hyd hydrology colleagues, to do a, a very rapid fire assessment of what the flooding would look like from uh, Super Cyclone Anfan. So this is uh, this was a, a lecturer here called Jeff Neal who leads that side of, of the project, and essentially they looked at how many uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people would be exposed to different levels of flooding, and I won't go into detail too much of these figures, but just this looking at the right one here, this is again that map of India and Bangladesh, um, and the colours show the percentage of population exposed to uh, flood inundation from that event. So we're talking about uh, the order of 5% five, five in the sort of extreme scenarios, uh, extreme regions here. Um, and that translates into hundreds of thousands of people being exposed along these, these lines. So just to take a step back, um, at what is the climate change potentially going to do in this region? Um, I've looked at three scenarios. I'm not going to go into the details of really what they are. Let's just concentrate on the low end scenario. Um, this is in agreement with uh, what we would say the upper Paris Agreement climate goal is. And then let's look at a high emission scenario. So one that uh, we hope we, we don't get to and it looks like we, we hopefully won't be on, on par for that at the moment. And then I've taken the latest uh, CMIP-6 models, they're called, so they're the latest climate models from around the world. And we've plotted the global mean temperature of, of each of these models. So the scenarios are on the x-axis here. Um, so for the low emission scenarios, you can see the spread is up to around three degrees uh, global mean temperatures, uh, but the average is directly on two degrees, which is that upper Paris goal. For the high emission scenarios, we're much higher, um, and the, the mean state is around uh, 5.5 5 degrees. Some of these models at the top, um, we don't necessarily think we're going to get that that high, but um, there are some they are something we could consider. So now, looking very specifically at the region, what do they say about sea level rise? Um, this is the range in meters of sea level rise in the Bay of Bengal, especially for the month of May. Um, so this is what you'd expect, perhaps that storm surge to be sitting on top of. And that's a really extreme scenario. We, we nearly reach a meter sea level rise. Um, and at the really low scenario, we've got about a, a fifth of a meter in terms of sea level rise. So what we've done is we've just we've just picked um, two scenarios here. We picked the average sea level rise from the red and the average from the blue. And um, uh, and I'll, I'll show you those results. So this is the change in population exposed. And I guess this is the, the sort of main figure of the talk. Um, so on the x-axis here, let's just take this low emission scenario. So the panel A on the, on the x-axis, I've got the population exposed. So the increase in population exposed. So just to remind ourselves, that's if super cyclone Amphan occurred in a future where we have um, stabilized at this uh, RCP 2.6. So at, stabilized it around two degrees uh, average uh, warming, uh, which is a, a likely scenario. On the y-axis, we put different levels of flood inundation. So these are three levels that uh, I, I'm told the insurance industry uses quite frequently. So um, 0.1 meters up to three meters. And then we've also split it into uh, India versus Bangladesh. And what you can see here is actually, uh, you even see some negative values here. So what are we saying? We're saying that climate change is a, is a good thing for uh, 
for Bangladesh if we stabilize at this scenario. Um, that's not what we're saying. I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. Uh, but for India, it looks quite bad. Um, in one case, we're almost getting 100% more people exposed to this uh, mid-flooding case. So let's just look at those values in the high emission scenario, that's C here. Um, and again, for, for really severe flood modeling, uh, sorry, flood inundations, so three meters, we're actually seeing not much change at all in Bangladesh. Uh, but we're now starting to see values of over 200% in um, each of these uh, regions. So just to say, I've got the absolute values of numbers in the paper as well, but I'm just showing the percentage change here. Um, because, of course, there wasn't too many people exposed to th three metres before. So um, it's a sort of high percentage of a small number, which is in some sense quite easy to get. So why are these some of these values negative? That's because we've also included um, population movement and urbanisation in these results. And actually, the population decreases in India and Bangladesh around 2050, 2060. Um, and they also become more urbanized, that it, so they're moving to cities which, in general, are further away from the coastline. So what you've got here is you've got a, a climate change signal really contributing to this exposure, um, but you've got a population change signal um, which is taking away from it. So uh, in some sense, a little bit of a good news story there. Um, I won't go through these values specifically. Uh, final... Final figure. So this wasn't actually in the paper and I sort of added it. It's a bit cheeky to add it, but I, I've done it just just so you know where we're going next. And just because insurance companies have been particularly interested in this result. So I thought I'd highlight it. And this really goes back to the point um, Chris was saying in his talk is that uh, to get to sort of hazard relevant scales, we need to think uh, beyond our, our global data sets. And so um, Chris shows a regionalization of a, a reanalysis. Um, that's all well and good if you've got a, a big supercomputer and you've got a big team and time to do it. So what Chris is doing in that product that's being released is, is, is great. But if someone came along and asked a different question, uh, it would take them quite a few years to generate that data set for a different region of the world or something like that. And so... Um, so we thought about this in terms of using art artificial intelligence to really get to those hazard relevant scales. Um, this is a term, in my view, that's thrown around way too much. And we spend a lot of time deciding uh, what problem is this actually relevant to rather than just randomly applying to it. Um, and tropical cyclones and in specifically the precipitation for them is one where we felt it could be really useful. And so for the same cyclone, this is a uh, work one of my PhD students is doing. Here's some of the um, uh, low resolution data, observational data we've got of this tropical cyclone. Don't worry too much about the units, uh, they're just showing precipitation. Um, the middle plot is the actual observed values. And so you can see there's a lot more noise in there. There's uh, values potentially much higher um, in here, potentially uh, twice as high, in fact. And so we've generated a, a, a machine learning model which can reproduce uh, the finer details of these tropical cyclones much better. And that's what there is on the right there. Um, so I'd be very happy to chat more about that uh, in the future. So the other advantage of using an AI model for this is that uh, with hazards, we, we see a lot of the damage in the extremes. And when you have extremes, you really want very large sample sizes. Again, that doesn't really marry up that well with high resolution data. So if you do have something a, a bit cheaper to run like an AI model, um, that could help with that as well. So I see these things as very complementary to, for instance, the sort of stuff that Chris was presenting. Uh, and I'll stop there, thanks. Perfect, thank you. Um, we're quite short on time for questions, but I didn't want to interrupt you there, Dan, because I thought that was a particularly interesting slide that you were presenting. Um, so uh, I think with that, we do have one question, but I might ask you to um, reply to that um, on the chat, if that's okay, so that we can jump straight to the, the panel. 
Thank you very much. Okay, um, so thank you for um, all of our speakers so far for um, their presentations on their papers. We'll move on now to the panel discussion. Um, so first of all, really, I'd like each of the panelists to um, introduce themselves. Um, so if we could um, start with um, Chris Weber um, and then jump to Aidan, then Cameron, then Kelsey, that would, that would be great if you could introduce yourselves. Sure. So, thanks, Katie. Um, so my name is Chris Weber. I work at Brit Insurance. Um, we're a specialty insurer, reinsurer. Um, so as, a, as like a risk carrier, we accept premiums and we in turn indemnify those that are insured when there's a loss. So I work within the research capacity of Brit, um, helping them develop their view of risk. The idea being that we take the uh, so meteorological and non-meteorological perils and we, and we look to see what we should be charging, how much we should be reserving in terms of a capital in terms of a capital loading to make sure that we don't go insolvent when a big typhoon or hurricane hits. My son. Yep. Cool. Hello, uh, Aidan Brocklehurst. I've been working in the impact forecasting team at Aon for a little over eight years. Impact forecasting is Aon's internal catastrophe model development team. So my job is to build catastrophe models with a focus on European atmospheric perils. And uh, before that, I uh, did a PhD at Reading. Hi, um, I'm Cameron Rice. I work at um, Willis Towers Watson uh, within the um, research network that some of you may have heard of. Um, so we um, essentially develop uh, partnerships with uh, academia and industry to do various research um, things that are the relevant for the insurance industry and, and corporates and financial services in general. Um, so I, my background is pr primarily in catastrophe modeling, so the use of the models, um, the evaluation of the models for our clients to um, look at whether or not they represent represent the science and, and view of risk and adjustment of those models where they, where they don't, and, and for things like climate change as well. And I am Kelsey Mulder. I am the head of research at Liberty Specialty Markets. I do a very similar job as Chris Weber does, uh, just for a, a different insurance company, insurance and reinsurance company. Um, and I would like to just add that, although people like Chris and I and Aiden and Cameron were all kind of enemies, if you will, in the industry, because we're all doing our own thing with our own secret sauce, um, we also collaborate a heck of a lot on a bunch of um, shared interests so climate change is one of them, and we'll we'll kind of dig into some of the further science that we're interested in. So yeah, although we are our own, you know, entities, and we're all trying to do our own corporate thing, um, we do actually work together a heck of a lot in trying to to kind of itemize all of our science items and seeing if we can share any research. Perfect. Um. So so with that, then um, bearing in mind the time I'll just jump straight into some of the um, questions that we already have um, for the panel but I will just ask for any of the participants if you have any um, questions that you would like to um, put to the panel please put them in the chat or in the Q&A and I'll, I'll pass them over. Um, so first question then um, maybe if I uh, aim this at you Chris and then um, the others can uh, kind of add their thoughts. Um, how do you think the science discussed today um, by our academics could be used in the insurance sector. Yeah, no, thanks. And, and I'd like to start by just thanking Kelly, Chris, Lawson and Dan for those talks. I think they're really informative. And uh, as you suggest, uh, there are certainly some applications to the insurance industry. Um, given they're quite disparate, I might just touch on each of them, just to, there might be different applications, um, but maybe some overarching themes as well. I think the first being sort of uncertainty as well. Um, and touching on Torsten's talk, we within the industry and you, and you touched on it already with your work with, with AXA, um, within the model model, of a, model evaluation framework, um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty and we don't necessarily have all the, all the information we need to validate on a observation basis. Like we're not, look, not necessarily looking at the accuracy, but, but rather this response uh, led sort of precision approach that you suggested. I think um, if you think of maybe a, a a wind peril in Florida, for instance, there's a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty that goes into modeling what that, what loss that would generate given a certain wind speed. So there's uncertainty in the wind speed, there's uncertainty in, the, in what we call like a return period of those wind speeds, but there's 
uncertainty about the the location itself so what's what's the building made of where is the building um for instance like geocoding there's this huge huge uncertainty as to where the where the building is actually located and it could be more material for some perils like flood than it can be for other perils that are a little bit more homog homogenous like wind um so i think the approach that you suggested i think is an approach that um is, is relatively widely widely used already within the industry um in a sense that it's looking at the, the most material aspects of, of that uncertainty or where's, where's the uncertainty leading to the largest changes in loss and in focusing our attention on those because because as Brit we could spend a lot of money trying to get the geocoding right if that doesn't have a massive impact in, ter in terms of material material perils then then it's, it's money not necessarily well spent but it, it might might work out vice versa but I think also just on that I think it's it's also maybe a way that we can as 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 the industry, we can motivate academic work and look at those most material aspects of certain modelled perils, uh, seeing if there are degrees of freedom within them that we, we could look to constrain a little bit more through academic collaboration. Um, so on the um, disproportionality uh, uh, talk from Kelly, um, I think in terms of the industry, I think there's there's a lot of lessons and potentially a few reminders that, that could be taken from the study. I think the, the insurance industry, or at least the traditional sort of London insurance market, be looking at sort of indemnity insurance. So there'd be a, a contract to uh, pay if a loss was incurred. Um, and, and that's like an insurance product that, that developed insurance markets are where it's prevalent in those markets. But if we look at a market like, like Bangladesh, for instance, um, and, and there's not a, a developed insurance market. There are alternative insurance uh, mechanisms or instruments that, that can be developed and can be sold. Um, and the, they don't necessarily have to cover individual properties. They could cover sovereign level. They could cover humanitarian efforts or, or things like famine in Africa or, or something along those lines. So in the, in the sense of sort of this idea of disproportionality, if there is... It's, it's one thing understanding, I suppose, the, the, the hazard, the vulnerability and the exposures. But then if we if, if there was a product that was targeted at a, a specific, specifically vulnerable uh, uh, location from like a social political perspective, then the humanitarian impact might be a lot greater than what we might model using quite general tools. And I think it's really understanding that uncertainty. Um, if those products were to go to market, it would help us reduce what we call like a basis risk, um, i.e. the accuracy or the, the correlation between what we would trigger a payout on um, if, in, in this parametric sense uh, and what actually is observed on the ground. Um, I think, yeah, it's just completing that whole picture and identifying where are the most vulnerable areas and how we best serve those through the insurance industry, because ultimately the insurance is a, is a tool to, to help improve resilience in these regions. And then maybe more directly, I think, um, and, and you touched on this in terms of the uh, the, the looming litigation risk um, and attribution of uh, climate. Um, well, if, if there was, for instance, a class action brought against uh, the financial sectors, there might be um, some, some cause for concern at the moment within the insurance industry uh, regarding that. Um, and it's um, it can prove incredibly costly to the industry. I think the last the last big case that the industry industry faced with the asbestos case and i think that they're, they're tolling up to almost 100 billion dollars loss in terms of the industry payout on that so if climate change is the next asbestos then it's certainly something that the insurance industry needs to understand better it's also just a practice just a practice of being more sustainable and more um i guess robust within the practices of each firm i think like Brit, for instance would be really motivated to to learn more about that and, and really to motivate that change um and then, sorry, just with the reanalysis side on, on Chris, I think in general, I think you touched on a lot of the points, the value of having reanalyses and the value of having really granular reanalyses as well. I think when we talk about impacts within the insurance market, we're typically talking about location level impact, i.e. a house, a, a as granular as you get. And I think it was really encouraging to see some of the steps that were being taken in the, in the next stage in terms of in, increasing that granularity. Um, and, uh, potentially or hopefully improving the fidelity of the model and then making it perform, I suppose, more like an impact model. Because I guess traditionally, um, reanalysis products are great to, to analyze regionality 
but in terms of um, validating what cap models, what typically will be price insurance with, um, observations obviously still hold the key because they look at the, the location level impact, so location level wind as opposed to the aggregated wind. And I think it's really encouraging to see that these high granularity re um, reanalysis products are, are breaking through now and, and are becoming more widely available. And then, sorry, finally, um, in, in, in Dan's talk, I think the, um, I think just the amalgamation of uh, hazard, in, uh, hazard vulnerability exposure uh, really elevates the, I guess, the, the total risk framework or like the, the components that, that, that make risk. I think the, the point that you made on exposure and um, the sensitivity of the, uh, of, of the risk metric to uh, exposure, I think is, is really poignant. And then going back to the sort of the, the first point I made in terms of those um, alternative insurance products that you could have, like a parametric product, for instance, if you were to take the last 50 years as your baseline and calibrate your product to that, and then in 50 years time, that's when you were basing it or today you were basing it and the exposure changed substantially. Dan has already shown there that the exposure changes means that the impacts on the ground are not gonna match your hist historical ex experience for the same event. So I think it's really important just to take stock of all of those components when when trying to evaluate a uh, risk for a specific area uh, and i'll shut up because that, that was quite a lot <laughs> that's really useful chris um thank you do any of the other panelists um want to add anything before i, I move on to the next question i made some notes but uh, chris's answers were quite thorough he's obviously doing his homework um i thought all the papers are great the um Convective storm climatology stuff from the reanalysis in Australia is quite uh, is a lot of interest to me without barging in an answer to the to the third question. And I thought that was very good. Perfect. Thank you. Well, the um the next question um I have, Aidan, uh, if, if, if you don't mind answering, is um what could be the barriers to implementing these um like scientific findings within um, the insurance industry? Yeah, cool. Um <clears throat> So the first thing I noticed was the sort of uh, a lack of basic exchange. I mean, for example, this event was great, and I've read four papers that I probably wouldn't have read otherwise. And um, sometimes, so um, when we were, I've discussed this with a few a few of the people on the call fairly recently, but something that I thought would be helpful is if there were um, some sort of existing summary of recent papers so that the um, academia as, a, as an entity is uh, passing to the industry um, summaries of things that they recently done as a starting point for finding papers and then equally going back the other way the industry being clearer about the things that it would um, not demand but would find useful and uh, means of feedback so I do use I do use papers there are papers that I read I take plots from them sometimes and put them into presentations and show them to people but the person that wrote that might actually not actually know that unless I see them at a conference and say I really like your work by the way um, because I'm not giving them an academic reference in the set in the way that there would use, usually be um, useful and beneficial to an academic. So there's maybe a, a lack of communication and also in feedback. Um, some other things I thought about um, in general, um, slightly boring topics, but things like data access for. So we've um, seen some good examples of some reanalysis work, but how easy realistically could I use that? And uh, recently had a bit of tediousness just trying to get some simple meteorological data from a supplier just due to data security and stuff. And when you're working in a financial institu institution, um, I made notes about regulatory control. Um, a lot of things, a lot of the time, particularly insurers, maybe not the largest insurers, that maybe have a bit more leeway to um, to think and to study things. Like we saw a good example um, of AXA being involved in some work. They're a very big insurer with people dedicated to um, to sciencey stuff. Whereas some smaller companies might be saying, "Well, I'm just trying to do what the regulator is telling me to do." That's you know, it's a full time job and a half for a lot of people. So there may be some drivers to innovate actually need to come from the um, more from the regulator than from companies themselves, big when they're smaller companies. Um, I think that people in the industry that are with an interest in science, so include sort of myself and the rest of the panelists, perhaps can try and push back up the need to spend more time looking at science to management. So I can say, look, I want to spend some time doing this. And at the end of the year, when I say, look at this scientific work I've done in these conferences I attended, the manager would say, that's great rather than why have you done that um i'd say that uh, competition can sometimes be a barrier because we do like to have our own academic projects that we keep to ourselves so i say i'm going to pay this university to do this 
and then I'm going to get some intellectual property that I'm not going to share and I'm going to use it to develop a catastrophe model. Um, there was an interesting point earlier about um, black box models, um, and I think that um, so a lot of the a lot of people working in a university, and, and maybe some people on the call would uh, would agree or disagree, um, probably haven't used properly used a catastrophe model. I mean, I make them and we license them to insurance companies or use them within Aon as um, commercial products. And I think there's probably a difficulty in making some kind of actual catastrophe model rather than just saying, here's my event set or something available to academia. And within the windstorm community, we've talked quite a bit about a toy model, but that's just one model for one region. And it's been discussed for as long as I've been working in the industry and nothing actually concrete has ever come out of that. So maybe stuff like open source uh, accession modeling and open source platforms might make it possible for developers to take, say, uh, simplified versions of models at lower resolution, maybe only with sort of basic vulnerability functions and make those available on some sort of academic uh, research-based non-commercial license. But I don't really believe that happens very much at the moment. And I think it's difficult for us. I mean, I'd, I'd love to say to uh, anyone at a university that said, hey, can I use your Windsor model? I'd say, yeah, of course, sure. But actually making that happen is almost impossible on a one-to-one -one basis. A whole load of other people then are getting involved and it probably wouldn't happen. Um, I think that runs down most of the notes I made. I don't want to sort of hog all the, all the potential points if anyone else wants to jump in. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to echo the point about the black box model. Um, I think that's really important. And just to kind of add to it, I think kind of one of the main outputs that we get from a catastrophe model is a big long table with information that's like on an event, a year that it occurs in and the loss. And you'll get like a 10,000 or 100,000 years of information. And that's kind of what, what we're working with. So it's about taking complex science from academia and then basically trying to use it to adjust this to reflect things like climate change or things that are missing from a model or, or those sorts of things. So it's about, there's a big gap there to take really complex science and then distill it down into this kind of uh, what we call a year event loss table and try to use it in that way. And that's kind of a, a big challenge. Yeah, cool. Now, yeah, thank you to whoever asked that question earlier, because that sort of really prompted me to bring that one up as well. One thing I'll add with this is um, some of the science that comes out is is potentially really regionally specific, which can be really useful from a model user perspective. So let's say that we're noticing that wind speeds are underpredicted for a very particular part of Japan. I mean, that's really useful as a reinsurer who is looking at wind speeds in Japan. But kind of following on to Cameron's point, it's sometimes really hard to implement in model output. So that's kind of a, a blessing and a curse. So um, I know a lot of academic articles can have huge ranges of uncertainty and you can say, okay, well, overall Japan might increase in wind speed between 10 and 50%. And you may think that's not useful, but actually <laughs> arguably very, very useful um, for, for catastrophe model users like me who can do some of the sensitivity testing that uh, we've been talking about. So, um, be specific, but also if, if you have some kind of more vague or more, um, more I guess, wide, wide ranging uncertainties in your research, actually, that is arguably also very useful for us. Thank you. Um, so we've just got one minute left to go. So Cameron, um, could you um, put your thoughts together for um, the final question? Uh, what big topics would you like to see academics thinking about in the future? Okay, I'm going to try and be super brief. Then. Um, so I think so. I've, I've got three sort of key topics that can come to my mind. So the first one is um, present day climate conditions and variability. So there's a lot of work done on future climate, which is great. Um, but I think sometimes we can overlook what's happening present day. Um, so I think a lot of CAT models are calibrated based on history and often to kind of match the frequency and severity distributions that we've seen in history. But that's kind of got an implicit assumption in there that that history is correct right so it's kind of at the median of the variability distribution and it's not right and so we need to do more to understand where where kind of you know history sits within that kind of range of variability the second one is secondary perils and so by this i mean um things like um small and medium-sized losses um like wildfires floods to convective storms that can accumulate to a large loss to the industry there's a trend at the moment in the market where these losses are increasing and lots of people are trying to understand what's driving this is it it's part, probably partly climate change partly changes in explosion exposure inflation maybe some other factors and there's lots of research that needs to be done to better understand this um, and then finally 
um, linking hazard and vulnerability. And I thought Dan's talk was really good, kind of uh, you know link, doing that whole kind of chain right from hazard all the way through to vulnerability. And often in, in you, you'll see academic research that focuses just on one component. And you know we need to do more research that's actually linking those things together um, to kind of yeah that, have that whole value chain that can then be you know adding extra value to the insurance industry that way. Perfect. Thank you so much for 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 your thoughts and for also keeping it quite short. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, any final thoughts um before I close the call? No, happy. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so um, I just like to say thank you to um the Royal Meteorological Society um for um um facilitating this event and also for all of our um speakers and panelists for their um their their contributions uh, i believe it's been recorded so should be available um somehow maybe on the website yeah the website the website perfect um and yes just also then finally want to thank all of our participants for joining us today um i hope you found it to be insightful um but but please do reach out with any questions if um, you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye.